Good evening, good afternoon. We are live again this week, though in different places in the globe at different times. Usually I'm nighttime, Rose is early morning. We switched so we could meet Michael Galinsky um, this evening and have a real heart to heart talk. Head to heart talk. <laughs> I'm Dr. Tova Goldfine. This is TMS Roundtable Global. Uh, we are streaming live from Israel, and I'm here with my wonderful co host and professional partner and best friend, Rose Hoy, ISTDP psychotherapist. And we're going to talk with Michael Galinsky. Rose, can you just introduce Michael, though he never needs an introduction, but Lama Lo, why not? Mm -hmm. Good. Welcome, world, to this morning for Tova, it's 5 a.m. For me, it's mid-afternoon. And for Michael, it's 5 o'clock or 7 o'clock in the evening. 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, yeah. Now, we decided that we'd talk to Michael about the process of what's happening with patients with chronic pain and the alternatives and the ways of dealing with the fact that chronic pain creates this symptom in us that's a primary enforcer, as we, as, uh, as Melissa Farmer said a couple of weeks ago, a primary enforcer. So it prevents us, in actual fact, from thinking about our somatic experience, experiencing the fact that there's something else going on in our lives, avoiding relationships, self-esteem, uh, work problems, avoiding those and concentrating on pain. Wow. Now, Michael interviewed many people when he did the movie. And what we want, we, by inviting Michael tonight, we thought we'd actually explore the, the idea of having an extra person to speak to in regard to chronic pain, rather than relying just on reading or, or um any other meditation, any of those other things to bring someone else into your life rather than just trying and doing it on your own. Because many of the symptoms of a chronic pain sufferer is avoiding relationships. So by forcing yourself into a relationship with a therapist or a coach, you're actually changing the dynamic and you're forcing yourself to actually share your inner life, your inner experience of your suffering with someone else. Not the physical suffering, not that, but the heartfelt suffering. So, Michael, welcome again. Thank you. And thank you for being our inspiration. And thank you again for All the Rage. Now, anyone who hasn't watched All the Rage, Tova will put a put the link, link up. to it on yeah. the sidebar. Please watch it because there are so many examples of yeah. chronic back pain, various <clears throat> other pains, and various famous people yeah. who are actually speaking to Michael about their about their problem and how they were all always all the, persevering. I, so I, I, I think all the rage will I, it's I just don't feel it will ever be outdated. It mm. always feels like it's the right movie for the right time. I don't mm. think it will ever be outdated and the information in there. Yeah. yeah. Well I'm, the fact that it's it's sort of it's not making the, the filmmakers or the therapists or whatever important. It's making the patient important. And that's what I love about it. Mm -hmm. Because every time I review it and that and see it again, I see it from the patient's perspective. Mm -hmm. And their search. Search, search, search. Right. And this difficulty in believing that it's somatic. And that was one of the things that bringing Michael back, because he did that search. You know, he was one of those people that actually his dad had to tell him to go and see Dr. Sarno, mm -hmm. but he didn't want to. Yeah. 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 And, and, and reading Dr. Sarno's book, it's not that I didn't believe what Dr. Sarno had to say. Reading his book had been very helpful to me. Um, but yeah, I was probably still feeling like somehow, I, you know, maybe I didn't deserve to go to him somewhere. Like I didn't, it was a lot of resources. Or I didn't, you know, I didn't trust that he would hear me or I would hear him. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of different layers to all, all of the um, resistance that we have to all of these different issues that we face and dealing with them. And, you know, I think a lot of people, one of the first questions people always ask me after the movie is, 
are you, are you better? And you know, my, my canned response is, well, I have this disease called being human and it's going to kill all of us. Um, but I'm, I'm fighting it, you know, and, and it's true. And you I got mean, better. At, you got better at feeling. I did. Well, I spent a lot of it. Well, the point is, it just isn't simple. You know, yes, I am wildly better in so many ways and um, than I was when I was in a really bad place with these issues. But the, the pain was very real. The pain was debilitating. And yet I knew that the pain was distracting me from something, but somehow I, it took a long time to to really dig into that. And it's still an ongoing process. And by that, I mean, it's like I'm completely 100% functional human being, but I'm also a human being. And, you know, it ebbs and it flows. And I find myself understanding more and that raises, that brings up more stuff, you know? So then you have to kind of work through that. So I think anybody who says, Yes, I've, I've, I've healed as someone who's like healed, meaning I'm, I'm fixed, I'm perfect, I don't need any, I don't need to work on this for the rest of my life, is really someone who's denying their own death because they're human and they're going to die. And which yeah. means that they're going to constantly change, grow, and other things will, will arise. And, and find things that happen to them that's going to challenge them right. and going to bring up anxiety. But once they notice that they're anxious, then they're in charge again, aren't right. they? Yeah, absolutely. It's addressable. Yeah. Everything is addressable. I mean, and, you know, I think even before we start, we started this process well before the pandemic, right? The, it's we been, did. what, four years, five years? Five and, um, years. Well, yeah. Us, and it, uh, for for yeah. you or for Rose and I? For you guys. No, it was, yeah, the, it was the March of, of, of uh, COVID. The March yeah. of COVID is. So this it, March it, is going to be three years this March. Oh, wow. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, how long is it since you came to Melbourne? It must be five years now. Well, that's five years. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but, and but, but I guess my point is that over time and through all, all these things, you just, we constantly cho grow, change and, and get new tools. Mm. And for me, you know, uh, uh, slowly learning to do yoga has been really helpful. Um, that's because, really helpful. because you're not so flexible or because. No, no, because it, it's, it, when we the kind of yoga I do, which is called Hatha Yoga, um, eighty percent of the discussion is about what's coming up. What are, what are the feelings? And you know, it's not the struggle of holding the pose. It's what is what's coming up during the pose, and how do you find a way to relax even though this uncomfortable feeling arises? And the more that you practice that, which is essentially a form of somatic tracking, right? Being aware of what's going on in our in our body, um, but doing so in a way that's also present with how that's affecting our body and and the ebb and flow in between it is really powerful and the point that i think it you know you guys were bringing up is i think also having other people to engage in that process with gets us a little bit more out of our head and so maybe it's a yoga teacher maybe it's a therapist and maybe it's an acupuncturist and maybe it's a combination of all three yes. in it's or a it's a series of of therapists because sometimes we just have to be able to trust the person enough to trust ourselves to be able to be honest and present and it's not yeah. easy but but i'll say you know one of the things that like you brought up is the very first question which wasn't a question at the very first screening of all the rage was wow it was really brave of you to be so naked and i was like well you know you just, it, it didn't feel that brave it felt like necessary or whatever and then when people got really upset about it and you know were shaming me for being in it and stuff i was like oh that's what he means because it's going to it's going to, when, when we kind of dare to be present and naked, it, it does make people uncomfortable. And then that can come back to us. And then we, we have this urge to cut it out, but because of the movie and because of everything that's come after it, I've continued to do a lot of writing. Like when my mom was ill, I was doing a lot of writing about what she was going through, but also what, how that was affecting me. And it, it felt a little uncomfortable the first couple of times I did it, but I literally got flooded with, Oh my God, thank you. I had no way to articulate because I'm having to deal with that same thing. My, my parent is struggling and I, you know, I felt weird to talk to people about it. And so yeah. the, the, the point I'm making is the more that we are honest and, and, the, and it's, you gotta be kind of really honest, not like half honest. And, and we're yeah. willing to upset people by being honest. 90% um, of the people are going to be really relieved and helped by us being honest. And then the more that that comes back to you, the more comfortable it becomes. And you realize, oh, that person being angry about me talking about how I feel isn't about me. 
It's, about it's not them. about you. It's, a, it's about no, them. It's not about me at all, right? <laughs> and so if I have that negative reaction to them having a negative reaction, that's about me. And I, I could. Go, that's right. I don't have to go, hey, fuck you, buddy. I don't care what you think. I can just go, oh, wow, that must be really difficult it's for you. It's part of the pain yeah. drama that we just are so uncomfortable touching that part of ourselves. Yeah. And that pain is kind of a message to know yourself, which sounds new age, but it's we're seeing it scientifically being proven all the time. All the time. And and in fact, like it's it's so interesting when you look at uh, like the trend of like self healers on Instagram, like the holistic psychologist and people like <laughs> we're all saying the same thing. It's what, what what she's talking about is no different than what Catherine Handel is talking about. It, not at all. She's basically talking about the change triangle in a different way but she's really reaching people. And so the people who are using these tools and and they're, and they're, they're healing. So it's a therapist. Sometimes we actually do need that deeper, like direct connection. And sometimes we open a door through this practice of self-healing, which actually opens the door for us to go, you know what? I actually, I think I can accept some help now, but it's all, it's, it's all different layers and different levels and different processes. Mm -hmm. And when we stay stuck in the story, that I can't get better, I won't get better. People don't understand it's it, there's something physically going on and it's very different than anybody else's. Yeah, it's everybody's experience is completely individualistic. So no therapist is me able to say, here's the thing you do to get better. You know, you have to kind of that's help them not, to find it's not it. not the themselves. answer, is it? Hmm? No. Yeah. I said that's not the answer. Self reflection no. is is the is the is the wonderful thing when you see it from a distance. Right, but do you have self-reflection with the mirror of a therapist or other yeah. people or a group or even or even even with even with um diary writing, if you can yeah, self-reflect. Yeah, but I think so, but I think that there's uh, you know a lot of times people will be stuck without some help, and a lot of people don't feel yeah. like in a deeper way that they deserve to get help. Like they should be able, they should tough it out. They should they should that's be right. able to do it, yeah. and and yeah. it's a problematic thing. I mean, that's where I was at. I just like. I was frustrated with myself that I couldn't get myself better, but I also was trying to carry way too much. And um, yeah. Yes. And that duality of it, that, that, you know, I should be perfect. I should be able to fix this back pain and I should be able to have all those commitments with work as well. Right. And I should be, I, I'm speaking about you now. I should be that artist that I am. I should be able to do all those things as though none of those things should be uh, beyond me. Right. But I mean, a person can only do so much. Right. (laughs) So something had to give. And of course, it's your back that gave, wasn't it? And then everything gave. And then it wasn't just my back. It was, it's everything, right. You know, and it's, it's, it's the whole shebang. And, uh, and I think that's what it is for everyone. So. Can can you, can you share, you, you I know you have a good memory. I mean, I, again, I, I didn't know about ISTDP when I saw the movie because I hadn't met Rose yet. And um, I hadn't learned about the power of that and that that was what Arlene Feinblatt was doing with you. And that is what, I mean, Sarno would recommend that type of therapy right. to to people. Um, and so it, I, I wish it would even have more like people know about it, but most of people, a lot of people don't know about it. They don't know the connection. They don't really know that's really what Howard Trubiner is doing with Alan Abyss, Alan Abyss with the yeah. um, with what they called it. It's sit. So can you just chat about that experience? And like, did Sarno say, go, to, I would like to know the details that Dr. Sarno say, Michael, your sciatica is BS, go see Arlene Feinblatt. Like, I want to know what happened, the details. Uh I and I th- I'm sure he suggests that I suggest I see one of his therapists and okay. I think I tried a couple and I, she was able to give me an appointment and, and I actually I didn't go many times because I really wasn't ready to to go into that place but um it, it just, I love the clip you gave I yeah. love the clip that you right. put on the movie. I, I went and I, I filmed a couple of episodes but um, you know, I wasn't really ready. I still felt like I I needed to do work myself as well, and and I keep doing that work and keep going a little farther into understanding. But the hardest part of all of this, I think, just for everybody listening, um, is it's just not it's it's a very complicated process because part of like one of the things that's really useful about the um, the holistic psychologist, you know, <laughs> her book about self healing, 
it's a lot about understanding that you're not going to change the people around you and you probably need to set some boundaries and maybe let some of those people go even if they're close relations if they're not willing to accept you for who you are and that doesn't mean you have to attack them or force them to accept you as who you are but like still recognize that that's about them and it's okay to kind of have some boundaries at times and sure we want to try to keep these lines of communication open but if if you're coming to understand how something's really problematic for you maybe you need to step aside for a little bit until you can work through it so you're not as reactive until you can get to a place because a lot of times we think well it's really their fault because they make me react this way well you know what actually part of the problem is is we're a, a you, bit highly reactive you've got the buttons you react yeah. Yeah. yeah, you got the buttons. You, you Maybe you need to work on the buttons a little bit. And and when yeah. that happens, you do your somatic tracking. You recognize, wow, it's making me feel weird. I'm not actually going to respond right away until I can respond. Because if I say something, that will just be a reaction. And we'll just get into that drama. And, you know, it's important to try to work with people um, so that they understand what you're trying to do. Because everyone's going to want to push you back in your lane. We don't want to upset this thing that we've constructed together, this drama. You're trying to be in another play, and I want you to stay in a streetcar named Desire. <laughs> um, so I, I, I keep keep I keep experiencing, you know, the, the how the ego hurts us, how it can help us, the ego put in put it into perspective, the and then how the ego can hurt us because the the ego part. comes up because I'm embarrassed, I'm ashamed, I don't want to do. You know, what if he's going to think like it's, it's the ego that gets us in this cycle. Yeah. So when you become aware of the ego, you can gently bypass it, let it go and go. Actually, the thing that the ego is telling me I have to do or that I need to be special or whatever. You yeah. go, oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yes. That. I don't actually need to do that. And in fact, I actually don't need another drink. No, thank you. I'm, I'm all right for tonight. <laughs> you know, you can yes. you can you can have a conversation with the ego. But the, I guess the thing is, right, like all resistance is going to create resistance. And so when we're even resisting our ego or resisting those urges rather than being like, wow, look at that's Observing that's them. That's the self-reflection right. thing that, yeah. Observing because once it. you're observing, you realize that that's not you. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I want to answer this gentleman's question. I just want to, um, I just want to put down where to see uh, www. All the rage. I don't have to put www. All the yeah. Anyway, um, Anthony, welcome. We we don't, I don't know you, but I'm happy that you're on the show, and I want to just uh, bring up your question for maybe Michael to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe he can give you some tips, and then Rose and I can give you some tips. So he seems he seems. I think he might have just seen our our ad, our Facebook page. Difficult to know where to start. I recently. Red healing back pain. Did you see the movie number one, Anthony? And I'm eager to take action, but not yeah, sure. Uh, unfortunately, I don't really know. Um, a do I mean, I, I, I oh, was in North Carolina. North. I didn't yeah, see that. There was New York. Yeah, you're 17 miles away from me. But um, and I'm in Chapel Hill, but I'm, I'm not sure I really know uh, of a doctor to see here. Um, I think you would probably be better to almost just have a discussion on the phone with People, yeah. <laughs> people, yeah, we, people like Rose, Rose, and I and give, Rose and I give a complimentary consultation to talk with you and sort of help you direct you to somebody close to you, to someone virtual. Right. That's our job is to even be messengers to get you to the right place. Um, and, I, you know, I don't know how bad your your back pain is, but, I, you know, I go um, do yoga <laughs> with Thousand Petals Yoga, which is a local yoga studio. <laughs> and that's been really helpful. There's also another woman I know who deals locally um with um so it's thousandpedalsyoga.com but then there's also um i think it's yoga and uh physio uh laura uh no, i can't remember her last name it's laura, laura terry is a local um uh physical therapist and yoga practitioner who might be helpful and then um there's other good massage people in the area that are really more about it more of like Reiki energy work that can be really helpful in bringing up feelings that then you can process. So there's, there's a lot of, um, plenty of support. Yeah. Okay. You know, and I always say it's, it's a relationship. Sometimes you have to go to a few yoga people or a few therapists and feel the safe. Right Where do you feel the safest? Yeah. Okay. Anthony, first of all, watch all the rage. It puts it in context for you. 
because at the moment you're suffering acutely. Yeah. So until you actually can see the context of the pressure you're under, and, and that's why I like Michael's movie, because it actually shows Michael under pressure and it shows us other guys. What are their names? Howard Stern. Who's the other one? Uh, Larry David. Yeah. yeah. It shows them all under pressure, no, high you. profile pressure. And of course, their back is going to go. They're not going to let everyone know. They're not going to let the producer know that they're overburdened, that they're pushed around. And then they're going home to their families or whatever, and I've got a commitment there. So, yes, the pressure is there. So, first of all, look at that, because that's a good starting point. And then, as Michael says, yes, find some ways of relaxing. Yeah. Find some ways of reflecting. Talk to Tova or myself or both of us if you want. But yeah, do those it, first steps first. And the first thing to do is really dial down the fear response to our back going out. We think, oh, my God, I'm going to be like this forever. I'll never get better. And in fact, you know, the first line of our movie is the stories that we tell ourselves shape our sense of who we are. And it's really true. And so if the story we're telling is it's predictive coding. Yeah, right? yeah. We're telling ourselves, oh, my God, I'm not going to get better. But really, one of the biggest tips to think about is a really deep belly breath resets our vagus nerve and, and gives us a little space to like be like, OK, I'm going to be breathing is really important. It really helps us to feel safer. And if we feel safer, we can respond more safely conscious yeah. breathing conscious yeah. breathing it's okay to breathe now also <laughs> people with pain their breathing all is always up here as michael said it's a belly breath so that the diaphragm moves because well, up it, here it, the diaphragm barely moves yeah. and the vasovagal system can't be activated yeah. and that uh, that response remains in us and it's like we're at, in the olympics on the starting blocks and we've got a 100-meter run to do, and we've got to win the race, whereas we don't. We're not on the starting blocks. So. And, you know, Rose, I, I just wish, I mean, I don't even, maybe I learned this in chiropractic school, but I don't remember, and I relearned it recently. Like, I didn't know this. I don't know. I didn't know that about the parasympathetic nervous system and that a deep breath and an exhale activates it and helps me create my own anti-inflammatory medicine. Like, I didn't know this even. And so... This is not common knowledge, and we have to sometimes get into pain to realize how much power we have within. Mm. And I'm sorry that's sometimes the, the, the road we have to take, but there's so much self-healing that can happen from somebody. You know, Michael, did you, you know, did you know this? Did you know about the breath? I mean, you were a runner, you were in college, you were playing music. I, did you no, know? No, I mean, I didn't really know about it until I started really getting deeper into this, but yeah, the, the breath is always helpful. Like, so sometimes if I, if I have trouble sleeping and I'll be trying to go back to sleep and it, you get in that kind of mid space where you're half asleep, not asleep. And I realize that it's not really working. I'll sit up and I'll just do some meditative deep breathing for three or four minutes. And it's a lot, it's a lot better. And it's hard. It's not easy to do that. You had to stop. You had to, to like stop say, and you have to say, this Michael. Is yeah. and Michael can be like, wait, but I'm busy, but my dog needs me. My kids need me. But like Michael needs attention. That's what the pain is saying. Stop, 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 come inside. And, and it's not easy to do that, but you stop, you take a moment. Yeah. Right. I think and, as Michael yeah. said, it's difficult though. It's difficult, it's but difficult. it's also, it's the thing to remember is for any of this stuff, it is a long journey. And, you know, you start making the steps forward and you look back and you say, wow, I've come pretty far. And then you turn back around and go, oh, I got a long way to go. And, and it's true, but that's what life is. Life is a journey. And, you know, we keep wanting to get somewhere. We're not going to get there. We're, we're just, we can keep getting closer to there, but you're not going to get there. We're there already there. Looking. We're already there. You never well, Exactly. We're, we're all doing <laughs> We're already home. We, but we do, you know, right. We're home. You get home, right. And your mother's still yelling at you. So the, the point is, yes, we can get back home, but you know, it, it's a process. And I, I say that because I think, people hold up this idea, well, why can't I get better? These other people get better so quickly. It's just however you're you're framing it. Like, so I, I'm doing great. I'm doing absolutely great. And I still have work to do. And I still, I, that's, that's, that's acceptance practice, right? Accepting where we're at yeah. and knowing that we have more to learn. That's, and, and that we will always continue to do better. You know, we're evolving perfect, perfectly imperfect. Yeah. 
Now, audience, you know why Tova and, li and I like to bring on Michael, because he's got a really, really lovely way of putting all this jigsaw puzzle together. So if you haven't caught on about what he's saying, please rewind and watch it again, because yeah. it's important to actually see that this process is an ongoing process. Yeah. It's not a race. Yeah. It's just to be. Yeah. <clears throat> just to be. Agreed. And, you know, and Rose and I will talk about the, you know, Rose is a specialist in IS um, TDP. TD, TDP. <laughs> and 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 I and I'm and I'm a, a magician of many of many many different tricks. And Rose is also a midwife and a nurse, which gives her enormous experience and enormous uh, ability. And so we, when we met, we didn't realize that we had these, you know, we, we, we do have these different skills. And, and I learned so much from Rose. I learned so much about feeling, about connecting, about accepting my feelings. I, I really, I am so grateful, Michael, for bringing Rose and I together. And, um, I, you know, there's so many different methods that help people from coming from their head to their heart. And it's not, it's, it's, it's not one specific one. And like you said, we're all doing the same thing. Our goal is to get to the same place and to bring to the person yeah. the same place. And I'm going to go back to the statement of, you know, you have to feel safe with this therapist. And we've had a couple of psychiatrists. So we talked about that with that. Sometimes it's not a safe place. And so I'm saying to you, find a therapist, be feel safe or not no, no. Find another one. Good. Can I can you I interrupt, interrupt for a moment? You may. Sorry, my darling. Sorry. Okay. But it's not that you can find a safe therapist. It's that you need to find safety in yourself to reach out. Even even more important. Yeah. yeah. And but because, but that can but find, but being with someone who makes you feel uncomfortable can be make that more difficult. That's right. right. Someone you feel yeah. judged by, for instance. Yeah. And you want to yeah. feel safe. But you can also like, why does that, why does that bother me? Why do I, you know, you can all, every time you find yourself in a situation where you're uncomfortable, it's really an opportunity to figure something out. And exactly. you don't always have to run away from it, but you can also say, you know what, you can also respect this isn't the right thing for me at this time. And this That's is constantly evolving and we need to be constantly pushing that, you know, like yeah. when, when do I push into that space and say, you no, know what, I'm going to do this. I would go to, because we, we want to please our therapists. We want to please people. So this is a really important point. We have to know ourselves in that relationship, with right. that therapist. And we don't want to give our power to that therapist. So I don't want that therapist to feel. So it's definitely a, a, a you know, a dance. Yeah. Right. And uh, we can also just really just stop giving a shit about what other people think about us. You know, that it. really is helpful. That's good. That's not the, the next, the next movie. That, well, that I mean, is... That's, that's like, it's not so much like we need to be contemptuous of them. We just have to realize that we are giving other people so much power and, and largely like, this is one of the things I keep trying to get people to understand about Dr. Sarno is, you know, when we were trying to make the movie, the term trauma informed was not, a term that was in use widely. I'm sure there were some academic circles where people are talking about it. But since then, it's become like popcorn. Everything is trauma informed. But the truth is, the reason Dr. Sarno wasn't accepted is because he was practicing in a trauma informed way when nobody knew what the hell that was. And so uh, the point is, we all have had a lot of traumatic experiences. That doesn't mean that we aren't responsible for figuring out how to respond to that. Like we are not, it, it isn't incumbent upon us to make our trauma somebody else's responsibility. It is incumbent upon us to become aware of how that trauma affects us and mm. find people who are willing to work with us through that or avoid people who aren't willing to work for us until we've worked through it somewhat. So the, I think one of the problems is, you know, that, that, that I was starting to talk about from the beginning is, we begin to change and that's going to anger a lot of people around us. And the, the, the thing to do is to be like, okay, until I'm ready to kind of respond to that better, I'm going to avoid that situation for a little while, but I'm going to keep testing. I'm going to come back. <laughs> and I, am I able to, am I able to learn from that? Oh, I learned something, but I think it's time for me to go tonight and I'm going to set this boundary. I'm going to go, but I'm not going to be good. I have to go. Cause you're being an awful person. Right. You say, you know, I have to go because I've, I've got somewhere to be or I, I'm not feeling very well right now. Right. But making somebody else's responsible for how we feel, even if kind of, kind of they are, like if it's our parents were kind of abusive and we want to make, the, it's not going to help to make them responsible because you can ask for their help in changing. But if they can't change, 
at a certain point, you just have to kind of figure out how to deal with it. It's hard. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Because you've always got to see yourself as an adult that's got a shadow. Right. And and the, the whole goal is really to see the shadow because, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and exactly. And to thank them for bringing up the shadow so you can yeah. kick it in the ass and get it out of your way. Thinking about the shadow. Wait, Anthony, if you're still here listening, I have. I want you to pick up the book Healing Back Pain and find the page which has the, the, the eye, the, the, the eye is the unconscious. If you are still here, Anthony, and you have the book, because last week we had an amazing guest who had an unbelievable Sarno story, and he got the book by a doctor. He had eight years of back pain, and he was given the book by a doctor, and he, and he thought this is BS. But then he, he went back to it and then healed, like, very quickly. Oh, you did the audio book. Anyway, in the book, thank you, Anthony. Is and I didn't. I I Xerox this picture um, before I met you, Michael, because I didn't understand it. But it was all about the unconscious. Talk about how deep Dr. Sarno went. It's a picture of the conscious mind, the mind's a picture of the eye. You remember this rose? And then there was a third picture in the diagram. And he was talking about um, the unconscious and how that's. The, the brain perceives the feelings. Am I right, Michael and Rose, from the unconscious and then goes into fight or flight? Am I saying it correctly? Yeah, well, the feelings are are fear. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 But I, I, it's fear been interesting. Fear creates anxiety. Yeah. So, but I think a lot of it, the trauma comes uh, a lot of times from being punished for being who we are. So then you get frozen. Like, this is just like if you're crying because you're scared and then you're being punished, you just, you're already frozen and you just freeze. And so that becomes this unconscious feeling of like, you walk into a situation in which you don't feel safe and then you go into freeze mode, right? And, you know, some of it is genetic, some of it is learned behaviors, but, you know, it, it's it's complicated. It could be intergenerational trauma, right. which we know. So, so yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and so just but understanding that allows us to then have a little more compassion for ourselves, but really also for the other people, because here's the deal, right? Like a lot of us walk around being like, well, my parents sucked. They did this. They did that. And then we get to be their age and they're like, oh, crap, uh -oh. <laughs> I'm doing that, too. And like, wow. I better forgive them or I can't really forgive myself. I'll just push that even further down. So it's a lot of forgiving a lot of people, including yourself. But also First the people yourself. you feel harmed you because really like just to remember they were doing the best that they could and it wasn't very good. You know, we're not arguing that they did well, but they were doing the best they could. What, what more could they do? Right. Yeah. So that's really yes. what we're, we're, we're trying to do. And if you recognize they're doing the best that they could and you're doing the best that you can and you can recognize it's the best that I can, it's not nearly good enough, then I have to do better. And part of that means just being honest Part of it means taking care of myself a little bit better. And and part of it means like Billy being willing to let go of these stuck patterns of thought. And, and this was bringing to me, like you had just mentioned, we talked, I, I we got a dog um, four months ago. And this dog is a, a pit bull, American Stafford Terrier, Rottweiler, Doberman. It's very sweet, but it also has very strong prey instincts like at cats. And we have cats, so they haven't been able to interact yet. Um, but she's also really trainable and she's most trainable with a really positive dog training methodology, which is you do something right. She does something right. Give her a treat. You want her to look at you every time she looks at you, give her a treat. Now she starts looking at you all the time and that's the behavior you want. So you capture the behaviors through positive reinforcement. And the truth is in our culture, there is so much negative reinforcement around having emotions. And if we're negatively reinforced, it's traumatizing. Now, it sometimes doesn't go as fast as you really want with the positive training because it's sometimes hard to communicate and they don't respond. They do something wrong, but you punish a dog for doing something wrong. It doesn't know what it did wrong. It's just going to get more scared and do it again. The same with a child. The same it's, with a child. Exactly. So it's helping me yeah. to continue to be a better parent, even though my children are mostly grown, to continually check in with. So part of that is like, I want her to go for a walk. She's scared of the meadow behind her house. There's a lot of coyotes back there. And I would get kind of frustrated. It's like, come on, we have to walk. I can't, I'm not going to just let you sit there until finally I realized I just have to walk three steps forward and just wait. Sometimes five minutes, 
I'm not punishing her. I realize, you know what? I'm feeling frustrated. I've taken a deep breath and not be frustrated. I look back and she's come a little bit forward and just learn to take it slow <clears throat> and positively reinforce. And that is really healing for you. Because every time you don't do that negative behavior, like when you get frustrated, you go, oh, I'm frustrated. Well, that's absolutely ridiculous. This dog is five months old. It's scared as shit. Why do I expect it to do what I want it to do when it doesn't know what I want it to do, right? So, uh, you know, you learn that you've got this pattern behavior of expectation that's unreasonable, and yet you still follow through with that. So, I, you Could know, I... it's a lot of owning what our own behaviors are and our own beliefs are. That's right. Now, take that as how you treat yourself. Yeah. So does it help you to punish yourself? Not that I know of. <laughs> no, it doesn't. But that's what people do. Right. Yeah. It, it, it definitely keeps us stuck. And it's that, that feeling of being guilty about something that you think you've done the wrong thing. We'll use the dog as an example. Why would you punish the dog when he doesn't know that he's done the wrong thing? And yet yeah. we go and punish ourselves as though we've done the wrong thing. And right. because someone else punished us originally. Yeah. So we like, just keep the show on the road. Right. The dog shows you your shadow. Like you yeah. were trying to be the best dog parent you can possibly be. And you just keep screwing it up. <laughs> yep. Right. But, you know, the part of the point is we had a dog very similar 15 years ago. We were young. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't really have any wherewithal to figure out training at that point. And, and he was OK, but he would get in fights with other dogs. And so he was limiting. He had a lot of anxiety. And we worked on improving it, but we weren't as resilient as we could have been. So doing this right now has been really, really powerful to realize, wow, if you just stick to it and you trust the dog and you trust yourself and the dog makes some mistakes and you don't go, you dumb, stupid beast, you say, come here, I'm sorry, you're not getting a treat or no, thank you. And then, you know, give them the treat when they do the right thing. It's so much more powerful. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No. Yeah, it's isn't it lovely that we're able to use the example of the dog? Yeah. <laughs> because if we use the example of a human, it would create sort of a sense of um, I haven't done the right thing. Whereas when we use the example of the dog, we can see what the result of. Oh, of I, I absolutely didn't do the right thing with that first dog. And I can see the result. It wasn't very good. Right. Yeah. Like a lot of anxiety. And I was really and I was trying to do the right thing. But, you know. I, yeah. I we got her, got him later. We got this one when it was young, when she was young. And we've really been really intentional. And so I guess part of that is is learning that being intentional about the practice of of training ourselves, even training myself to be a better trainer yeah. is a really hard thing because we think, oh, I think that's stupid. I don't want to have to, I don't, I just want to go on a walk with the dog. Right. So you work hard for a year and then you'll be able to do that for the rest of the dog's life. But you have to do the work first, you know. It reminded right. me, it reminded me a little bit of, you know, if we could talk about the boundary between, because when we're hard on ourselves, we hurt ourselves and we push ourselves deeper into the hole of judgment and criticism, which can cause pain, which can cause the fight and flight mechanism to fire up and the volume to go up. Where do we draw the line between that? And if I'm a little bit self-reflective, I can motivate myself. I can do a little better. I can be compassionate and try a little harder. Where do we find that line of knowing ourself and knowing when it's one, you know, can you chat about that, Rose and Michael? It was well, the same way you get to Carnegie Hall. <laughs> what was that, Michael? It's the same way you get to Carnegie I'm Hall. I don't really know what you're saying. <laughs> practice, practice, practice. Okay, good. I love it. <laughs> or, or the D train, but either. Or, or what Alan Gordon says, trust the process. Trust the process from that basketball experience, that big basketball game. Trust the process. Yeah. Wow. But which is which is also the practice of acceptance. And it's hard. Like we said, what, what do you mean acceptance? Does it mean like just accept everybody? Is it? No. It's like, so if you're doing an acceptance practice and you're trying to run a small business, you still have to run a small business. You still have to show up on time. You still have to do things, but you don't beat yourself up if you can't. You, you just... You find that way to like, you know, I had this really great example of I was starting up an acceptance practice and really working on not getting upset when things were difficult. And I had, a, I had to take a flight. I was in Chicago, I think actually showing maybe all the rage. And um, I, I got up and I was going to take the bus to the subway to, to the plane and the bus didn't show up. So I started walking to the subway. It was getting late and it was raining 
and I had a big bag and I had to walk a mile and a half in Chicago. I got to the subway. Subway was late. I barely made it to the airport. And what I thought was, you know, a good amount of time, the lines were out the door and I had a bag that I had to check. Otherwise I would have to throw it out. Um, all the machines were closed. There was a, people were screaming at the guy who was supposed to be helping with machines. And I went up to him and said, Hey, I think it's really awful the way that people are yelling at you. I'm not going to make my plane. If I can't get a little help, do you mind helping me? And he went and opened a new lane for me. He said, you, you're getting help. And then he opened a lane and just was like, instead of getting upset about the situation, you accept what it is and you let go. You then treat people in an, in an accepting way and they're going to open up to you. It, it really is. We change our relationships when we change how we approach them. So that's what I was saying about like, if you can't react, you know, like someone maybe was harmful to you, right? And you find that you can't really be in that situation because you're reactive. Okay, it's time to go do some work and recognize maybe I don't have to react as much. And then when you react less, you find maybe that person who was doing that thing actually doesn't react as much. But if you still hold this anger and you're just in a space of resistance while pretending that you're not, it's not going to go well. And so that's where you have to kind of set that boundary until you can be responsible in that space. And again, that doesn't mean that your parents weren't absolutely awful and really messed up, but they're human and, and, and holding that grudge and still trying to stay in the relationship is going to be problematic until you can figure out how to forgive them as much as you can and kind of work with them. It's still going to be difficult. Yeah. I think in a way, even the idea of forgiving them is not as strong as, accepting them that that's their but the, yeah that's, that's what their, i mean that's the acceptance like they yeah. are who they are they're not going to change because yeah. i want them to i can ask them to but if i if i like i always think of this like there's this line between us right this is the midpoint and sometimes our parents will cross that midpoint into our space and we're like i don't i'm not so comfortable with that and you want to push them back but when we're resisting them we're pushing back right so it's yeah. you try to go up to that point which is Here's what my needs are. And I understand what your needs are. And I'm not going to push past that space because as soon as you do, you get resistance and, and you really, this is what I'm talking about is energy resistance. It's right. Like people are going to react to you. If you, if you cross that line, they just are. And once they react and then you react, it, it goes, that's the nuclear reaction, right? But if someone goes over that line and you're like, Oh, I think I'm going to step back a little bit and you so don't react you know, then they may push again and then you step back and then they get tired and it's over. So now but if talking, you push back, you escalate yeah. it. We're Sometimes talking about resistance. now Michael Brown's responding. Right. And this okay. is like a universal law of nature. If, if, if people, I'm sorry, if people did this, they wouldn't need therapy if they learned to respond. Yeah. Don't you? And Michael Brown said that. He said, it's like probably the most, I think he said it's the most important tool. Yeah. And that's week three. So week three is the most important to me in the Michael Brown 10 week meditation program, because that's where that's the, that's the key. That's owning your own behavior. That's it. It's yeah. like being responsible for your reaction. Cause when, when we react without responsibility, we throw it back on the other person and they're going to throw it back on us. But if we are able to respond, they may st still not react well, but we at least are, Protecting yeah. ourselves. Yeah. 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 We're in charge but, of our but, own But honestly, lives. the truth is 90% of the time, if you can respond well, you're gonna you're gonna de-escalate. Yeah. 90%. And I mean, sometimes someone's out of control or whatever, but 90% of the time you'll de-escalate a situation. Yeah. And that reminds me of the idea that that this trigger idea comes up. This person triggered me, but in actual fact, they didn't. Your triggers went off. And right. it's often a better a description to call it a button maybe because a trigger means that you're going to retaliate and pull the trigger doesn't it right. whereas you That's press right. your button yeah. and then you know the clown right. shows and, up and if you if you switch to acceptance mode you go oh i'm so glad you did that because that allowed me to recognize that made me angry and if you're angry it's always about you it is you're the one who's angry no one can That's make right. you angry Right. You, you know, know yeah. it can feel like they are making you angry, but that's a feeling. It's not a fact. Yeah. That's a reaction. The reaction. Isn't it? And, and, and not I, I'm not saying that blithely, like I'm a saint and I don't do that. I'm saying knowing that is really helpful. Yeah. Spotting it. Yeah. yeah. Spotting it in you. Yeah. You know, and I, and I always oh. say that we, you know, Rose, Rose and I have, this is like our 147th show 
Um, and, Is it really? and, and I and I was able to, to accomplish about 90 shows in Hebrew, and I do about once every six weeks, not as often. Rose and I are consistently weekly. So with all these shows, we say, you know, we look at the, the healing stories of people, and I say, well, the, the healing, uh, the common denominator was that they took responsibility. And Rose, she checked on me. She's like, check, said, Tova, be careful with that because people might feel blamed. And I said, Rose, you're right. So when we say people take responsibility and they respond or they take responsibility, it's not like blaming you. It's not saying what you're doing is wrong. It's saying it's not a, it's not a behavior you're familiar with. Right. Responsibility, responsibility. Is, is the ability to respond. Response, and something you have to learn. Ability. Something right. we have to learn work. doesn't come easy. So it's not out of blame, like take responsibility. It's more like reflect, learn to respond. reflect practice reflect. this uncomfortable place of being responsible and mm -hmm. see that that's the healing journey. Right. Yeah. So that that is an interesting thing because I think I, I was talking to this gentleman yesterday who had two failed back surgeries from mm -hmm. a doctor and He's and he oh I found him on Facebook. He had a tattoo on his arm. Life is pain, and from the letters were dripping blood. And I saw it, and I was like, Tova, do you want to reach out to this guy and take a risk and like jump in a deep sea? And I was like, Yes. <laughs> so I text him and I say, because he's on he's on this Facebook page that's all about pain and symptoms, and mm -hmm. they couldn't let me in, so I don't really advertise there, but I kind of want to reach people and just educate them. So I text him and he responded to me and he spoke to me for an hour on, on, a, on a Zoom. He's in Israel. And I said to him, what do you think the message is of your pain? I said, you know, because I meet people who can heal back surgery, failed back surgery. You're not a victim. And I said, what do you think the message is of this pain and why you're, in, why you're suffering? And he said, my body won. My body won. The message is my body beat me. My body beat me. And so it's like a war. Mm -hmm. and, and here's someone who could take responsibility for that experience and not blame the doctors. Right. Even if the doctors didn't make a mistake, I think his experience towards the surgery failed. Like it's not just the doctors, it's the whole responsibility, right. which I don't want need to talk about now. But the point is, there are so many people who don't even have that. And, and it, it's, it's partly the doctor's fault because the doctor could say, look, it, it didn't work, the surgery. You can do this, this, and this. It's not permanent. As opposed, doctors do say, you got to live with this, which is the worst thing to hear. So part of it is education. Part of it is what we talked about, understanding our self-healing, you know, putting together many things about our past and coming up with like, well, wait, I'm not a victim. How can mm -hmm. I heal? The doctors are not God. And that's why I love be, love that we work with doctors who are not God, who say, hey, yeah, yeah who understand, um, you know, the mind-body connection. And that to me is a really holistic doctor, an integrative doctor, a doctor who understands that this is permanent, but pain is never permanent. And that's what we're talking about. Pain, we're going right back to the beginning of the show, Rose. Pain is a informed. Oh, sorry. Yes. I, it is called, um, I wrote it, uh, a primary enforcer. A pain, primary enforcer. Pain is it a makes you go to the pain yes. rather than your feelings. Yes. Because your feelings are too hurtful. Yes. It's the feelings that are hurting us. But we need the pain to keep us away because yeah. the feelings are more frightening than the pain. Yeah. 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 And even if it failed back surgery, the pain is in your brain. I'm not saying that your muscles need work and that, I mean, you know, your, your body needs work. But the pain is being processed here. And pain is an emotion. And this is even more powerful in healing. Mm. I think also you need to include the vagal system. So it's not just your brain being a computer up top that's pushing a button. It's, it's activating an area in you, an, an inflammatory area, um, a cytokines, you know, um, adrenaline, all of those things are being activated in the brain. So the brain isn't like we don't give the credit to the brain 
that, that we need to because the brain is only responding to our fear. You know, our amygdala says it's dangerous, so our brain responds and gives us adrenaline or gives us what we need. So when that's that observing capacity that we need to look for. And remember for people, it's not always easy to reflect because reflection will often give us a feeling of being guilty. So, yeah, so it's just a, a lovely way of looking yeah. at your life holistically, yeah. you know, that it is safe. You can reach out to yourself and allow that self-healing capacity to rise up, as Tova says, that it's there within us. We're, we're a, a self-healing commodity. What do you call it? A what did you say, Tova? You say it better than me. Well, how about God made the problem? How about, you know, we, the body made the problem and the body can make the solution. Right. I mean, the body really is primed to heal itself. Um, there's a great book called How Healing Works. Can't remember the author's name right now. Um, but it's a doctor who did a lot of uh, massive studies. And he, after 40 and 50 years of doing this, he realized that almost 80% of healing comes from within. And once we understand that, wow. we realize that there's the healing agent and the healing agent could be both a placebo or a nocebo. A nocebo, for instance, is your doctor says, you're going to have to live with this pain. They're basically saying you need to be aware that this is always going to be there rather than a placebo, which is, I assure you, your body knows how to heal itself and you will slowly get better. We hope for a faster outcome. The pain is going to be there for a bit, but it will go away and you can feel safe in knowing that. That would be a placebo. Maybe he didn't give you anything for it, but he gave you belief. Oh. And belief is what activates healing. Yeah. It's oh. If your brain is thinking you can't heal, it doesn't activate the healing process. I remember years ago, this lovely young guy in the surgical ward, <laughs> his bones didn't knit. And they, they put a, a, um, a plate in and the plate didn't even knit. And I thought after doing ISTDP, I thought if only I knew at the, in those years that there was something going on for this kid, this 17-year-old, that he was round in the wheelchair in the ward with this, un, with this broken bone that wouldn't heal. And I thought, yes, if only he knew that there was something going on in his life that kept him in the hospital with us, some sort of safety mechanism within that. that and to, to continue to do that, he had to stop the healing process to happen because otherwise he'd be in danger or whatever. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I understand what you're saying. You look back at things and say, oh, I, I see that now that that might have been very useful. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's yeah. why it's, it's kind of, bit, I think people get so frustrated, for instance, about, um, you know, Dr. Sonner having so much trouble getting his message out because it, it just disrupts all of that awareness. Yeah. And so the more that we can do to spread awareness and, and I, I'm saying part of what I started talking about with all the self healers and Nicole's work getting out there and Catherine Hendel's it, these ideas are rising into public consciousness at a certain point. It's really is like the ship is going to just going to go upside down. And um, there's, there's, you know, we're, we're in a, in a very shifting time, right? Yeah. <laughs> we can see this, that. This guest in, in response to Anthony's uh, comment, he said his son, said to him, why don't you go to the doctor, dad? And, and you know, Anthony said to his son, the doctor's just going to give me ice and stretch. I, I need more. So this gentleman last week, he's, an, he's a wonderful man. He's from originally from India, living in Florida. He wrote a book called The Straw That Broke the Camel's Back about his healing eight years. His medical doctor gave him the Sarno book. Yeah. And I said, I want to meet that doctor. He, 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 he's trying to reach the doctor. I want to bring him on our show. Because any doctor that's going to, hand the book is the doctor of the future right. i think it happened to eddie lindenstein his doctor said to him mm -hmm. why don't you think about some mind but something it was also another doctor that did it and you know so and then you have dr hanskin who's who's and you have all these amazing doctors that we that are we work with in the pbda which is an amazing resource right. so part of I mean, it is the, the, also the research is being done everything is moving in that direction and i think even as we're talking to people today it's easier for them to understand this idea that, oh, there's something going on. And, and you know, we, we kind of perpetually are saying the brain, the body, it's one system. It's like, you, you know, you have a nuclear reactor and you have the cooling tower and you have the heating coils, 
right? And it's pretty simple what you do and you lift up the shield and then that reaction happens. Our bodies are way more complex than that. And there are separate parts, but they're not separate systems. And, and I always talk about it like doctors who are looking only at the physical body and not thinking about the emotional body and how that affects the physical body. It's kind of like working on a car and saying, you know what? I don't really understand these fluid systems. I mean, I know the fluid is going back and forth, et cetera, but I'm not really understanding. So we're not actually going to deal with the fluid system. We're just going to deal with the physical systems. Wow. And it's like the muscle systems or whatever, right? It, or the organs and muscles, but not the the, the fluid systems because we don't understand them. Your car is going to die very quickly if you ignore the the fluid systems. And so if you ignore the impact of the brain on the physical body, it's 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 just insanity, really. And isn't it amazing how many people will get better from just these narrow-minded doctors? Because that because this is again, people get better with medicine. Medicine is wonderful. We're not here to bang, we're not here to, you know, bash doctors. We're here to say that if you can't get better from your doctor in a in an easy, you know, like take the medication or get the surgery, then something else is going on. Right. And this is where when surgery, I mean, I said to this guy, you went to get surgery. Surgery is supposed to heal. It didn't work. So plan B, don't sit in your body and get tattoos all over your body about life is painful because now you've just got a big message to your brain that you will not heal. And it was- well, It just gets on this side. Life is pain that you can heal from. I said, I want to <laughs> I want to take a black magic marker and put, and I felt, and I said to him, you know, this is my TMS because I'm so passionate about this work and I want you to like get it. He said, Doc, I hear you. I got to think about it. It was like a lot for him. It was a lot for someone to handle. And he had no idea. And this is the 21st century. He had no idea that there was options and that his brain and that he could get better and that his muscles could heal. So, you know, this is where, you know, I, uh, you know, I have to, you know, have a session with Rose to talk about how not everybody's interested in what I have to say and that we're really just talking to 20% of the people but there's more and more, more and more and more. And that's why I, I, you know, like to the end of time, I will be calling you, Michael, every month and saying, are you ready to come on for another show and talk about this over and over again until it's habit, till it's habit, till it's, it's, I get up in the morning, I brush my teeth. I get up in the morning and I think about being responsible for my anxiety and, 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 and being compassionate about my anxiety. I didn't even learn that you know, in, in, in chiropractic school. So it is something that pain can teach us. Right. The, you know, and you're you're a better, stronger uh, person for your pain. You're probably a better mm -hmm. husband, a better mm -hmm. father for your pain. And, you know, I'm so sorry your mom and dad can't be here to talk to you about they're here. They your keep pain. Bothering you know me. they're here. And, you know, uh, you know and, and I know that you want to, um, you know, so, um, Talk a little bit more about where you're at now with when you have pain, when you have your, do you get leg pain? Does that your sciatica come back? It's not so much that, but that leg where I had pain is, is much weaker. And so it's, it's a little tighter and the, and some of the muscles don't work so well. So yeah. yoga has been helping, but I, you know, part of that acceptance is just being like, okay, it's in, in yoga every day. They tell you one side or the other side is one side's high, tighter yeah. than the other side. And it's, yeah. It's really learning to accept where you're at and not pushing too hard. And that's 80% of yoga too, is like learning. So if you're a perfectionist or someone who works too hard, I'm always working too hard in yoga. Yeah. So I'm always having to like realize, oh, if I just don't work so hard, I actually can move into the, the pose. Or it, it, you know, it's just, it's about acceptance in that way too. Yeah. And, and a few months ago, I know you got some hives. Maybe it was a year ago, you got some hives because you got triggered. You got button, your buttons were pushed. What did that come Yeah, from? I don't even know why, but I got them, but I knew what it was. And I, so instead of getting like, oh my God, I have hives. I'm like, I'm not sure what's going on, but I know something's going on. And that's what's really powerful too about it is I know, I don't know what's going on, but I know something's going on. And, yeah. and then you, you basically tell your brain, I, I don't have to freak out about this. You know what? I got to slow down today. Maybe I can't do as much. And um you know, I had a very hard year last year working on this show um, about the Savannah Bananas, and I'm yeah. gearing up to do it again. And I, I've already been a lot better about taking it a little bit easier, being a little calmer, and accepting I can't get everything I'm trying to get, and that I need to slow the fuck down. And so what's that process? Like, not slow the fuck down, because that's bullying yourself. 
No, I mean, it's jokingly like, okay, dude, it's going to be fine. Like, I know, because I oftentimes feel like I have to be in three locations at once. Yeah. I can't. So that's that. So tell us how you're compassionate with yourself and how you calm yourself down. Well, like, no, I just, I'm, I, I'm grateful that I'm there having the opportunity to shoot. And uh, I give myself the compassion. No, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. And in fact, if I don't push myself too hard, just like in yoga, I'm going to get better footage anyway. Right. So it right. all works out. Right. Um, <clears throat> if, if, if you were to recommend to some of the listeners about, besides the self-talk and the self-reflection and the kindness and compassionate, do you recommend, do you not recommend, but do you think that for you, the journaling helped the most, the meditation, the swimming, like for you and your journey, what? I think what developing, tool? developing, like I was just talking, um, my daughter is going to move and get a new job and she had stopped doing yoga for a little bit and she was going to start the new job and, and start the yoga up. And I said, you know what? I think it's really important. And it'd be easy to be like, I'm too busy to start at the beginning. Instead, you start at the beginning because you know you need it and it's going to take some time to get up <laughs> going, but then you make it a part of your routine. So part of it is figuring out how to make this process a part of our routine. So we're routinely checking in, but we're routinely meditating. We're routinely doing yoga. We're routinely doing the things that help us to get better. Um, while also giving us a little bit of grace to not do them if it doesn't work out at a certain point, right? Like I'm going to try to do yoga every day it's probably going to default to four to five days a week. That's great. You know, but if I can, I'll do it every day. Like we started the year at the yoga place I'd go doing like, it's a, it's a 30 day practice. So it's just 30 minute program every day, but I was able to do it even while traveling and stuff because it was only a half hour. And I found it was really useful to just be extra focused for that one month and saying, I'm really making this a priority. And I've continued to do it even a little bit more after that because I got into the habit of doing it. Right. So sometimes it's really about developing habits where we treat ourselves better um, and we take care of ourselves a little bit better. And part of that habit is recognizing when we haven't done that as well as we might have liked to go. Eh. Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, we're just going in and out. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're uh, I don't I don't want to say to my brain that we are technically challenged. but <laughs> Rose and I do spend a lot of our time working on the technical part. And like, we would kind of wish that we had a, you know, a deeper connection to you where you could help us all the time. We, we feel a little guilty when we, when we call on you to help us, but we might call on you again. All right. um, I, I'm just recommending to the audience because I, I, I find that um, someone just said, um, Mark Schwartz talked about he ordered all the rage and it was great. And the word is getting out. Thank you, Mark. And there are two other movies that I think I follow up with all the rage um, you know, and then I recommend This Might Hurt, which is an mm -hmm. amazing totally. movie. And then you, you saw Love Heals. I saw I just, a little part of it, yeah. I just can't recommend enough about yeah. how, how the power of love is <laughs> chemical. Right. Chemical. This is not like Oogie Boogie Dalai Lama. This is a chemical reaction in your brain. You know, right. I didn't know this until I met Hanskin, that when I'm thinking an anxious thought, which could happen 20,000 times a day, my body will create an inflammatory reaction. Right. Now I can, it can, now my body can process that inflammation. I don't have to get, you know, pain, but I need to be aware. Oh, there's me being, in, there's me feeling anxiety. And then there's compassion and love and that's healing. Right. And the anxiety also then triggers more fear, which then triggers more response. So it's it, the important thing to be disrupt, to disrupt that process with that compassion but also using your, your thinking brain to say, I'm safe. And you use your breathing to do that. Like you said, using a connection to someone else, give someone a hug, right? Or ask for a hug if you need one from right. someone that you're close to. Right. But it is, it's so, it's, it's all these different elements and accepting that it's all these different elements and we can't control all of these elements and we're just going to keep doing the best we can. And if we keep doing the best we can, we're going to keep getting better. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, Michael, um, it's amazing, and we'll we'll meet again in a month, and maybe yeah. um, maybe there's some some guest you might want to invite on and sure. meet with us. Um, let us know. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much. Thank you. You're, just, you're an incredible, you're an incredible sous chef. 
for Rose and I in this show. And um, the best is yet to come. Thanks, yeah. everyone, for being here. And um, have a wonderful evening. Thank your wife for letting us letting us have you late at night. Give her a big hug for us. Okay. Okay. All I appreciate it. I'll, I'll talk to you guys well. Bye-bye.